So it is my um, absolute pleasure to have Crystal Fraser, David Natcher, and Rena Squirrel with us today. Um, I, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Crystal for a welcome. Hi, Devlin. Uh, Drink Weensy show re Crystal Gail Fraser Vilji. She won Cut Da Juliet Mary Bullock Shanunt in shoot at Bruce Fraser. She T8 in shoot. Guyet C D2 to at Marka Andre uh, Shitsu to inchu to at Richard Bullock Shitshi to inchu Anuvik to at Dechencho Genjik Gwichia Gwichin Ithli. Um, hi, my name is Crystal Fraser. That was uh, my Dingy Zhu introduction. Um, I'm coming to you today from beautiful Treaty 6 lands, homeland of the Métis Nation, just outside of Edmonton. Um, I'm originally from Anuvik, Northwest Territories, and it's my absolute pleasure to be here with you this afternoon um, in my role as a director on the board of the Gwich'in Council International. Uh, so the GCI, as some of you will know the organization, represents 9,000 Dinjiju or Gwich'in in the Northwest Territories, Yukon and Alaska, and as a permanent participant in the Arctic Council. Uh, we are the only international organization where Indigenous peoples have a seat at the decision-making table um, alongside national governments. Um, GCI really supports, sorry, I'm just in the middle of this, the home with a five-year-old. Um, GCI supports Gwich'in by amplifying our voices on sustainable development um, and the environment at the international level, um, really to foster uh, resiliency and healthy communities. We engage at the Arctic Council in its working groups, and, uh, and also it's very important to us to create partnerships to advance Dinjiju priorities and interests. So on behalf of everyone at the GCI, we uh, really extend a warm welcome to you all. Um, it is important in our work that we share back our learnings and create uh, connections between people and communities. Food security and sovereignty are an area of concern across the entire Arctic, and especially in areas where subsistence harvests, uh, excuse me, subsistence harvest, dependence on migratory species such as caribou and fish, um, and really limited access to major centers occurs. Um, Rena's work on food security comes out of our participation at the Arctic Council's Sustainable Development Working Group, and the Arctic Food Innovation Cluster Project is looking at approaches to food and entrepreneurship across the Arctic to better understand opportunities, but also to connect networks. The Gwich'in Council International uh, wants to uh, better understand these issues around food, secu food security initiatives um, across the nation, uh, which again really helps us to foster and strengthen the connections with other parts of the Arctic to um, support research and knowledge sharing, um, and then also to advance food sovereignty. Um, Rena Squirrel, who is here today, um, was hired to explore individual and community initiatives across Dinjiju communities. And we are really excited that you can join us as she sh shares her work with us this afternoon. Um, so before we pass it over to Rena, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Natcher, who is Canada's lead on the Arctic Food Innovation Cluster Project, and they are going to tell us about why this work is important in context of the Sustainable Development um, Working Group. So over to you, David, and I'm so excited to hear your presentation, Rena. Well, well great. Th thanks, Crystal. I uh, really appreciate that. And uh, I want to thank Devlin for inviting me to participate today. And I want to thank all of you for uh, calling in in the in a world of Zoom that we live in. I know one extra meeting is is often too much. So I appreciate you taking the time. And I hope you find that this is uh, of, of interest. And I think you will. I think uh, 
you know, Rena's going to have a lot of interesting things to share. So I just wanted to take a couple minutes to provide a little bit of a context for for the work that Rena's been been doing, and um, hopefully it'll it'll trigger some questions and some thoughts that you might have for, for myself or, or or Devlin or or Rena. But real quickly, I'll just say I'm a I'm a professor at the University of Saskatchewan. And over the years, I've had the pleasure of working with Quechin communities in Alaska when I taught, well, when I was a graduate student at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, and when I taught at the University of Alaska in Anchorage. And so that was a pleasure, and I've had the opportunity to work in Old Crow and some other communities in Yukon over the years. So I, I know that food security is a really pressing issue, and I also know that there's no quick fix. And I, I think we have to try to be as creative and innovative as we possibly can to address this really complex issue around, around food security and food sovereignty. And the project we'll talk about today is, um, you know, hopefully one of those strategies that could address the high rates of food insecurity a, a, across the North. Uh, as Crystal mentioned, this project is supported by the Sustainable Development Working Group. And the project, this project we'll talk about today was actually initiated back in 2016 under a, a different title. And the 2016 project was called the Arctic as a Food Producing Region. And Canada, along with other Arctic states, set out to understand the food production status and opportunities uh, across the Arctic. So what foods are produced, where are they being shipped to? What are the revenues? What are the what what foods? What what does the Arctic food system actually look like? And specific to Canada, we, we learned that annually northern Canada produces about 80 million kilograms uh, of of wild food, you know, marine products, seals, agriculture. However, the vast majority of that food is exported and it's exported as raw products to over 133 different countries um, throughout the world at an annual revenue of about 800 million dollars. So a lot of food is leaving the north generating a lot of income for others and at the same time northern communities in Canada are suffering from really high rates of food insecurity and actually the the imports of food are being subsidized by the federal government. I think it's a, it's a very good effort, but we're importing foods like chicken strips and meatballs and, and other highly processed foods at an annual subsidization of about $75 million a year. So with that kind of understanding, that led to the second project, the Arctic Food Innovation Cluster. And really, so the goal of the innovation cluster was was how can we recapture this the food that is leaving the Arctic, and rather than creating this these large exports, can we create more sustainable regional food systems that are keeping the foods in the north, generating employment and revenue opportunities for for northern communities? We'll never we'll never totally you know, displace imports of foods, but can we lessen our independence on those, those imports in a way that provides nutritious, culturally compatible foods to the people who need them most? And that's the, the current project that we're, we're involved in now, this Arctic Food Innovation Cluster. And it's essentially a strategy to address the high rates of food insecurity by enhancing local economic development opportunities through entrepreneurship. So can we create economic opportunities for communities in the, in the production, processing, transportation, and retailing of, of Northern foods in a way that can benefit them most, most directly? Um, it, you know, it's not without its challenges. But I think we've all committed to really trying to be as strategic and, and innovative as we possibly can in, in, in doing this work. And the, the work that Rena is doing right now plays a really, really big part of that in trying to understand what, what is already going on in the communities. How can we support those initiatives better? 
and actually lead to a more sustainable food system uh, in communities and northern regions. So with that little, um, you know, kind of preface, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over and I, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I'm really, really excited to hear what uh, Rena has, has to share with us uh, of her work. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to pass it over to Rena and, and thank again, everybody for, for, for calling in. I think this is going to be really, really interesting. So. Hi, Joe David. Hi, Joe Crystal. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I am just going to uh, present, uh, pull up the slide here for my presentation. There we go. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay. So first of all, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for attending. Um, so I'm just going to introduce myself in Dinjiju. I drink Vinzi Shilakat, Shuri Rina Skrill Vilji, Tetle Gwichin Ithli, Naa Rini Firth Vaji, Tetle Gwichin Gwitsa, Ti Yaa Dug Skrill Vaji, Didi Kwe Gwitsat Ili, Shitsu Naa Vahan Joan Charlie Vaji Okro Witsat Inli Ako Sat Shitsi Naa Viti Benford Vaji Tetle J Witsat Inli She Nu She Zu Nan Katat Natea Sat Real Dosidel Go Vaji. Um, as you can tell, uh, Jinjiju is not my first language, but uh, I'm trying my best to learn and uh, definitely not going to stop until, until I learn, until I'm fluent. <laughs> but uh, in my language, which is called Jinjiju, um, I said, uh, Good afternoon, relatives. Uh, my name is Rina Squirrel. I am Tetle Guchin from Tetle J. Uh, my mother is Rini Firth from Tetlige. My father is Doug Squirrel from Liddy Quay. My grandmother is Joanne Tetlichi from Old Crow. And my grandfather is Ben Firth from Tetlige. Uh, I have two sons, uh, Natea and Riel Dosidam. So, yes, uh, hi, Cho, everyone, for taking time out of your day to attend this presentation. Uh, before I start, I would like to say a big hi tro to all the people who volunteered to speak with me about their experiences and their stories about how they obtain food in the communities. Uh, this project would have been impossible to complete without their input from the Gwich'in community members, and I'm so thankful for their knowledge and for their kindness. Uh, for the past four months, I've been talking with Wichin people throughout Canada and Alaska to learn more about current food initiatives in the Gwich'in communities. This project was an opportunity to meet new people and to reconnect with family and friends uh, to learn more about how Gwich'in people are getting their food. The information that I have gathered is an initial step towards understanding the current state of food security in our Gwich'in communities. Uh, but further research should be conducted. So in this presentation, I will share some of my research on food initiatives in the Gwich'in communities. Uh, I will cover the importance of food and how it connects to the Gwich'in culture, uh, economy, and identity. Uh, food initiatives in the communities at the individual and community levels. And also ideas on how we can advance and strengthen Gwich'in food sovereignty. So let's get started. So who is Rena Squirrel? Um, I am a mother, a wife, a daughter, an auntie, and a gardener with two green thumbs. I, am, I was born and raised in the Northwest Territories, and I'm so proud to be Gwich'in and from the Gwich'in Nation. Um, I also have two degrees from the University of Alberta, a Bachelor of Arts in Native Studies and a Bachelor of Secondary Education with a Native Studies minor. 
uh, while I was attending university, I had a summer job as the community, uh, community garden coordinator. Uh, this job entailed traveling to all 33 communities in the Northwest Territories uh, to work with the community members to encourage them to grow their own food and create community gardens. Um, I absolutely loved this job because uh, this is when I began learning about food security in our northern communities and the importance of being able to access healthy local food. Um, so the uh, of the photos here, the one in the top left corner, um, that's a photo of me in, uh, in Old Crow. Uh, that pail that I'm holding is a pail of muck duck that uh, my uncle gave to me right before I was about to jump on the plane. I was in Inuvik and he gave me this pail of muck duck and he said, bring this to Peter Frost, or sorry, um, Stephen Frost in, in Old Crow. And so I jumped on the plane and that was my carry on, this pail of muck duck. And I sat down and I got to Old Crow. And when I got to Old Crow, I was walking down the road. Like I've never been there before, but that's where my grandmother is originally from. Um, I went for the, the Gwich'in gathering in 2014. And I was just aimlessly walking down the road with this pail of muck duck. And uh, thankfully uh, community members um, helped guide me to where, find where Stephen lived. And uh, I found Stephen and I gave him his pail of muck duck. And, uh, I had the opportunity to visit with him and, and to get to know him. He's a, a respected elder in the community. But uh, I just wanted to quickly share that story because, um, you know, it's just a, an example of, um, you know, Gwich'in people sharing food from the land. Like, it's a great way to connect with people and to practice our Gwich'in values of sharing. Uh, so who are the Gwich'in people? Uh, the Gwich'in are one of the most northern indigenous peoples in North America. We are part of a larger family of indigenous people known as the Athabascans. Uh, Din Jiju is our preferred name and throughout this presentation you'll hear me use both terms Gwich'in and Din Jiju. So the Din Jiju have lived on the land since before Canada and the United States existed. Uh, according to our oral history, uh, Gwich'in people have occupied this area since time immemorial, uh, or 20,000 years, uh, according to conventional belief. Uh, there are 15 communities across the vast area from northern Yukon and Northwest Territories in Canada, and to the Northeast Alaska in the United States. Uh, there are many Gwich'in families that continue to maintain winter and summer camps outside of the communities. Uh, hunting, fishing, and trapping are important culturally and economically for the Gwich'in people. Uh, caribou, moose, and whitefish are staples of our diet. So where are the Dinjiju communities located? Um, as I've mentioned earlier, there are 15 uh, Gwich'in communities. There's five in uh, Canada. There's Anubik, Fort McPherson, Aklavik, Sigachik, and Old Crow. Uh, the Gwich'in communities in Alaska include Fort Yukon, Arctic Village, Vinitai, uh, Chikiltsik, Beaver, Circle, Birch Creek, and Canyon Village. Um, so I just wanted to quickly mention that uh, three of the 15 communities, uh, Inuvik, Fort McPherson, and Sigachik, have access to a highway. Uh, they're able to get their market food trucked in, and also community members are able to, or they have the option to drive south to buy food. The other 12 communities that are not connected by a highway uh, receive their market food by boat or barge or airplane. <clears throat> So uh, transition from a nomadic lifestyle to a permanent community living. Our nomadic lifestyle changed when the fur trading companies created posts in our territory to trade animal furs for Western products. My family on the Firth side played a key role in this transition. My great great grandfather was John Firth. Uh, there's a photo of him on the top right corner there looking very Gwich'in. <laughs> Um, he is uh, originally from the Orkney Islands in Scotland, and in 1871, when he was 18 years old, he started working for the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, he was sent to the most remote trading posts, uh, the tiny Peel River Posts, now known as Fort McPherson. Uh, in 1876, they put him in charge of the Peel River Post, 
and in 1878, he renewed his contract with the Hudson's Bay Company. And by 1893, he was the chief factor in charge of all trade in the entire region. Following his retirement in 1921, the management of his Hudson Bay Company post was passed on to family members. Uh, my grandfather, uh, Ben Firth, was one of the few people in the Fort McPherson who had a secure job. Uh, he could afford to order food from the stores down south and get it delivered by barge, which came to the community once a year. My mom, Rini Firth, remembers being a child and sitting along the side of the Peel River waiting for the barge to arrive. It was an exciting day when the barge did arrive. My mom remembers bringing boxes and boxes of food home. Her and her sister would search through every box to find the apples. When she found it, she would immediately take a bite out of the apple. And she remembers the freshness and would savor every bite because it wasn't very often you get apples in the community. Over the past 150 years, there, ha there have been many lifestyle changes among the Gwich'in that have led to most of us living in communities year round and relying on market food for a large portion of our diet. <clears throat> so uh, what is food security? Uh, food security is defined by the United Nations Committee on World Food Security. Uh, it means that all people at all times have physical, social and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food that meets their food preferences and dietary needs for an active and healthy life. Uh, so why is it important to focus on food security in the Gwich'in communities? Uh, because not all Gwich'in people have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food. Uh, food insecurity is a serious problem that is only going to get worse with the effects of climate change and the increase in fuel prices. Um, so we'll move on to the first section. Uh, so this is the uh, importance of food and how it connects to the Gwich'in culture, economy, and identity. So it is important to focus on food initiatives in the Gwich'in communities because how the Gwich'in obtain food is unique considering our remote location, the cost of market food, and our reliance on food from the land. By understanding what is going on at the local level, we are better able to support the communities and know what food initiatives work and what don't work. The initiatives that work need to be supported and expanded on to ensure that people have access to healthy local food. So food from the land uh, connects to the Gwich'in culture because the process of harvesting food from the land is a part of our traditions that we have been practicing for thousands of years. Food from the land and our Gwich'in culture is intimately connected. You cannot have one without the other. The most important animal that we harvest is the porcupine caribou, which migrate throughout the Gwich'in territory, uh, providing food to all the communities. The Gwich'in creation story tells that long ago, the Gwich'in and the caribou were one. As they separated into two beings, they became relatives and made an agreement. The land would sustain the caribou and the caribou would sustain the people. They would each keep a piece of the other's heart within themselves. In that way, their lives and their well-being would forever be connected. Uh, so this is a quote here from uh, Sarah James. Uh, she is a respected elder from Arctic Village. Uh, she says that we are the caribou people. The caribou are not just what we eat. They are who we are. They are in our stories and songs and the whole way we see the world. Caribou are our life. Without caribou, we wouldn't exist. So I, I really like that quote. That's, uh, I feel like that really helps tie in the uh, our, uh, our identity with the, with the Gwich'in and, and food. Um, <clears throat> so uh, food from the land connects to the Gwich'in economy because it is almost impossible to rely solely on market food uh, because it's just way too expensive. Um, another barrier is the lack of employment opportunities in the communities. Uh, that makes it difficult to afford to buy food from the store. Um, this is another um, quote 
the, from an, another respected elder from Tête Léger, uh, Alice Fitricroix, who is actually uh, my godmother, and um, someone who's uh, very well known. Uh, uh, she harvests fish and stays out at her camp at eight miles, uh, usually all summer. Um, but So she says, uh, very few of our Gwich'in people have jobs, and the rest of the people have to make a living out there on the land. And I remember we have to make use of everything, everything from the land, like moose, caribou, and fish. Oh, and uh, just to point out the top right uh, corner picture, that's a picture that I took when I was in Old Crow uh, in 2014. Uh, it cost $14 for a, a jug of milk. So um, food from the land uh, connects to the Gwich'in identity because our culture is so intimately connected to the land and the animals. Harvesting and preparation activities being uh, bring individuals in the community together, helping to maintain social relationships, facilitate knowledge transfer, and sustain spiritual connections with the land. The caribou herd is a big part of our identity. The caribou have been providing us with food for generations. The herd also connects us spiritually to the land. This is why the Gwich'in are adamant about protecting the Arctic wildlife refuge, where the, where the caribou give birth to their calves. The Gwich'in call this area Jikwatsan Gwandai Gwatlit, which translates to the sacred place where life begins. So now we're going to, uh, I'm going to share some food initiatives that I've learned uh, throughout my research. I've created two categories for this section, uh, so individual uh, food initiatives and then also community level food initiatives. So this is just a summary of, uh, of the individual food initiatives that I've come across throughout the Gwich'in communities. Um, so for the most part, uh, individual food initiatives in all the communities fall into these categories, but not every category applies to the, the Gwich'in community. Um, for example, uh, some communities don't have access to a local store or a local restaurant. Um, so the, the list here, I'll just go through it with you. Uh, so the individual initiatives include hunting, fishing, or harvesting plants from the land, uh, grow your own vegetables, um, approach a local food bank, buy plates of food um, from local people, uh, order food online and pay for shipping, uh, buy from the local store, travel to surrounding towns and cities, or um, buy food from local restaurants. So um, the first couple that I interviewed uh, was Florence and Harry Carmichael from McClavick. Uh, when I first started searching for people to interview, I knew I had to contact Florence and Harry Carmichael from McClavick. I remember as a kid uh, visiting McClavick and buying a big bag of fish strips. Um, it usually didn't last long. Uh, one bag would be gone probably before I got home. Uh, usually, so when I talk to people and I interview people, I, I end the interviews by asking who else should I interview? And Florence and Harry Carmichael's names would always come up because they have developed and established a reputation of having the best fish products in, in the Delta. Uh, they work hard all spring and summer to harvest and process enough fish for themselves and enough to sell to the communities and the surrounding communities. Um, so when they're ready, when the fish is ready to sell, uh, they would advertise on Facebook and then they would travel from Aklavik to Inuvik by boat, and um, they would usually sell out within within a couple of hours. So there there is a big demand for for their fish. Oh, and then also uh, Florence, uh, she also has a green thumb. Uh, she has a, a greenhouse where she grows a variety of vegetables, and uh, she has enough to feed herself and to give away to family members. Um, I have Florence on my Facebook page and I really like her posts because she's like showing how she harvests her plants and how she stores them and uh, yeah, very, very inspiring. <clears throat> so the next uh, individual food initiative is my friend uh, Kim Campbell. 
Uh, Kim and I, we used to work together back in 2014 on the community garden program. Uh, we traveled to every community in the Beaufort Delta, including all the Gwich'in communities. Um, we, we went to the communities to strengthen food security by encouraging community members to grow their own food. Uh, Kim and I traveled as far as Ulahaktuk and we dipped our toes in the Arctic Ocean. I, um, I interviewed Tim, uh, Kim about her indoor hydroponic systems that produce vegetables year round for herself, her friends and her family. Uh, she says that the growing system is easy to use. It is self-watered and the lighting automatically adjusts to the plant's needs. Um, Kim's investment into this personal hydroponic system solves a problem that she experiences living in Inuvik, uh, which is the lack of vegetable options at the store and the lack of fresh, affordable vegetables. So next we have um, an initiative that's uh, common in a lot of the communities, um, which is to cook and sell plates of food to other community members. Uh, most of the Gwich'in communities don't have a local restaurant. Uh, there is a demand for readily available cooked food. And some people are feeling this demand. Uh, the people selling the plates of food would buy all of the ingredients from the local store or would get the ingredients uh, flown in to the community. Um, they would cook the plates of food at home and then advertise on social media like Facebook. And then they would they would sell their, their food that way. Um, I think that this is a great initiative because it supplies the demand for cooking food and the people selling the plates uh, can potentially make a profit or create an income for themselves. Um, the price varies depending on the dish. Uh, there are a variety of food options I've came across online, such as burgers, lasagna, deep fried pickles, chicken, and even sushi. So next, I, uh, I interviewed Maureen Clark. Uh, she is Gwitja Gwitchin from Sigachik. Uh, she has been harvesting food from the land her whole life. Uh, she harvests berries, uh, meats from various animals, uh, various kinds of fish, and plants for medical purposes. Uh, in the summer, Marine would uh, take people out to her fish camp and be out there for, for weeks at a time. Um, I asked her, uh, you know, how, how can we encourage other people uh, to go out on the land and to make their own food. Um, and she said that, that people need a space in their house to prepare the food. So that's one of the barriers that I've, I've noticed. Um, she says that every house in the community needs a smokehouse and their own drying rack in a separate unit. So that was, um, that, that was something that uh, not only Maureen has mentioned, but a few other of the community members that I've, uh, I've interviewed is that the, the infrastructure needs to be there. Um, so the next person I interviewed uh, was Brennan Firth, uh, who is Ketle uh but now lives in Arctic Village. Um, he, uh, he's been living up in Arctic Village now for about five years, and uh, he says that um, buying food at the local store there is not sustainable. He says that he buys most of his food from, um, like, he said that most of his food comes in freight. So he said it's about seven hundred dollars to, to to a month uh, to pay for the food, and then on top of that uh, to pay for the freight to get the food into the community. Um, so he said that he doesn't buy any of his meat from the store; it all comes directly from the land. And um, yeah, he uh, also uh, Brennan is also uh, a well-known fiddler. Um, he's uh, he's really good on the fiddle. He uh, is usually at the Midway Music Festival and playing throughout the Gwich'in territory. Um, so one of the questions that I asked Brennan was um, our, our Gwich'in value of, of sharing and how he would describe it. And uh, he described it by uh, paying respect to the animal's life is making use of all parts of the animal. And sharing is believed to bring luck to hunters. So I, I thought that was really interesting. So uh, Rich Francis, 
his father is Tetley Guchin from Tetlege. Um, his first experience with cooking meat from the land is when his grandmother, Mary Frances, uh, they were at their camp just outside of Tetlege. At a young age, he moved away from the north and lost his connection uh, with his Guchin identity. Uh, when he became a chef, he started reconnecting with his indigenous culture and traditions. Uh, Rich is an advocate that is fighting for the rights of indigenous people to continue creating and serving food in a culturally authentic way. Cooking and selling food from the land is considered illegal in most provinces and territories in Canada, uh, but this does not deter Rich. He says that we have to challenge the government in order to create change. Our people have been harvesting food from the land long before Canada was created. So yeah, he was he was very uh, interesting to to interview and very passionate about uh, indigenizing the um, culinary arts with uh, yeah. So he's uh, oh, and he also has um, a seventh fire dinner, which is a dining experience where he cooks indigenous food and teaches his guests about reconciliation with indigenous people through food. Um, he also has a uh, a show on APTN where he um, he also uh, he travels throughout Canada and cooks uh, indigenous food, and then talks about reconciliation through food. So the next section is uh, community food initiatives. So this again is a, a summary of um, some of the initiatives at the community level. Uh, we have um, some communities that organize community hunts. Uh, this actually has become more and more common. Um, it just economically, it makes more sense for people to go out together. Um, given the increase in fuel prices and um, some people don't have access to the equipment needed to go out on the land. Uh, so local hunters would be hired to go out on the land and hunt for people who cannot hunt for themselves. Um, some communities have community gardens and greenhouses. Um, some communities are applying for funding from the federal and state governments for food initiative programs such as on the land programs. And um, and they teach people how to harvest, cook, and preserve local food. Um, so communities uh, feast, uh, community feast is uh, something that is throughout the Gwich'in territory as well. Um, usually they put on a feast for a significant occasions such as graduations, weddings, funerals, or for Christmas. Um, in all Gwich'in communities, it's a common practice to share with others, which is a part of our Gwich'in values. So um, Beaver is an isolated Guchin community with a population of 80 people. Uh, due to its remote location, it is challenging to get fresh vegetables into the community. Some community members buy vegetables and fruit and get it flown in, but this is not the most reliable method because there's only one plane a day that comes on weekends, weather permitting. Uh, there are sometimes delays in receiving their food package and fresh, fresh food ends up going bad before it even gets to the community. Uh, Nellie Weiner is the coordinator for the community garden, and she says that she grows a variety of vegetables and gives away everything to the community members. Uh, she is hoping to expand the community garden to include a year-round growing system like hydroponics. Um, this way, the community members would have access to fresh local produce year-round. Uh, the pictures on the side here are also from Nellie. Uh, she said, yeah, everything that comes out of the greenhouse is just given to the community members and people are so happy to receive this food because it, it's, it's difficult to come across. So um, the next initiative is in Tete Leger, uh, so Fort McPherson. Uh, they received funding to build a community freezer uh, Chief Wanda Pascal said the programs made available through the funding had everything to do with her band's traditional activities. The Community Freezer program has already allowed us to share knowledge about country food preparation, caribou meat, cutting and making traditional foods, including drying of caribou meat, uh, Chief Pascal says. Um, I think that this is a great community initiative um, because uh, 
you know, as I mentioned before, a common theme I'm hearing from the communities is that not having access to infrastructure uh, to process food from the land. So next we'll go over to Old Crow. Um, so the community members in Old Crow wanted to take ownership of the food supply in the community. So they elected to open their own store, the Old Crow Retail Co-op. Uh, the community used to be serviced by Northern uh, before it closed. Residents say that the store did not provide healthy food under the Nutrition North program. Uh, when the Old Crow Co-op store, uh, oh, sorry, with the Old Crow Co-op store, uh, community members have a say in what is sold in the store, and now uh, they have more healthy options like fruits and vegetables. Now we're moving on to Inuvik. Uh, so in 1998, a group of volunteers transformed an old arena into a fully functioning greenhouse. The greenhouse is open to local community members for a small fee and some volunteer time. Uh, there are over 170 garden beds the community members can use. On the second floor of the greenhouse is a commercial space where they sell plants to cover the operation costs. Uh, so when I was the community uh, garden coordinator, uh, I used to work at the at the Nuvik Community Greenhouse, and uh, this is where I learned a lot about uh, gardening in the north. And I'm so happy to see where the, the greenhouse is today. Um, when I used to work there, it was back in 2015. Um, recently, the greenhouse has expanded to include chickens and a heated hydroponic container, which will provide the community with vegetables year round. And the produce uh, grown in the hydroponic container will be sold at the local grocery store. And they will also uh, be part of a greenhouse's annual veggie box. Uh, which is a program uh, now available year, year long uh, where community members can buy boxes of vegetables for $20 a week. Um, so here are some examples of community food initiatives in Aklavik and in Old Crow that relate to berry picking. Uh, depending on the season, the communities offer programs to encourage uh, community members to get out on the land to harvest. Um, the two uh, pictures here of the um, advertising for the, the programs um, is just something that I came across online and I thought was worthwhile to share. So next we're going to move on to the uh, Midway Lake Music Festival, uh, which is located on the Dempster Highway. Um, for myself, my family and I, we uh, uh, we always made sure that we made it home for the Midway Music Festival every year. Uh, this is such a fun weekend uh, full of dancing and visiting and eating a lot of food from the land. Um, when you're at Midway, it's customary to walk from camp to camp to see family and friends. And usually when you're at somebody's camp, it's custom that you would eat something. Like there's always food, there's tons of food there. And uh, so yeah, it's custom to go to somebody's camp eat with them and have some tea. Um, Paul Andrew attended the festival and uh, he he described the food available. Um, this is what he says. He says that uh, there's beaver meat, there's dry fish, there's dried whale meat, muskrat, yeast, and almost any other country food you want. And of course there are berries. Eventually Oh, sorry, every day, mainly the women in their favorite offering from the earth. So after the festival is over, so the festival happens um, once a year, it's usually the long weekend in August. Uh, so after the festival is over, the area is still used year round uh, for people to bring their fresh, freshly shot game to the area uh, to um, process the meat and to properly store it. Um, the area is also a great location um, for on the land activities. And the Fort McPherson School often brings their students here to, to learn um, on the land skills. So um, I'm going to move on to the, the last section here of my presentation, uh, which is ideas on how we can advance and strengthen uh, Gwich'in food sovereignty. Um, as you can see, there are many different food initiatives currently going on in the Gwich'in communities. Um, 
So in this final section, we're going to uh, go over some ideas that I've developed throughout my research on how we can advance and strengthen um, glitching food sovereignty. So the first one um, is uh, Indigenous people need to be included in resource management. Uh, for thousands of years, the Gwich'in people have been living closely with the land and are able to extract resources from the land in a sustainable way. Uh, today in our society, we're extracting resources at an alarming rate, uh, a rate that is unsustainable and will have negative effects on future generations. An example of the negative effects from over extracting uh, is the severely low number of chum and king salmon in the Yukon River in Alaska. The Gwich'in and other Indigenous nations that live along the, the Yukon River rely heavily on the salmon to feed themselves and their families. The Gwich'in people have valuable knowledge on sustainable resource extraction that needs to be utilized when creating policies around resource management. Um, the other recommendation is uh, educational opportunities uh, for the Gwich'in community members. Um, I, we need to continue to organize on the land programs uh, that teach people how to harvest, process, and preserve the food from the land. Uh, we need to teach the importance of nutrition in eating healthy food uh, daily. Uh, this is a big one too. I think that uh, yeah, learning about nutrition and what's in our food um, is really going to help change that mindset from relying a lot on market unhealthy market food that's available to transitioning to more um, food on the land and food, food that's uh, healthy and that can be grown in the community. Um, also, a recommendation is to adapt the school curriculum uh, to include the above recommendations and also to learn how to grow your own food in the community. So this is one that I've been I've been saying for a long time that the like being like to know how to grow your food or to provide food for yourself is such a valuable skill. And and I would love to see it in our schools and for, for kids to be taught this at a young age. Um, I think that that will really help with um, with changing the mindset around food and uh, and yeah help help in um, securing or being more uh, food secure. Um, so we need to ensure all Gwich'in people have access to the infrastructure and the knowledge needed to harvest, process, and preserve food from the land. Um, so. This is uh, one that I've, I've kind of mentioned before is that that's one of the barriers that the Gwich'in people are experiencing is the uh, not having the, the tools or the resources or the infrastructure to to process food. Um, and uh, so this this is a big one that I think that we should focus on um, is just ensuring that everybody has access to that. Um, and my last recommendation here is uh, Gwich'in communities working together. Uh, there are 15 Gwich'in communities, there's 9,000 Gwich'in community members, and we're all experiencing the same challenges when it comes to food insecurity. Um, I believe if all Gwich'in communities will work together um, to strengthen our food sovereignty, we'll have a better chance of ensuring that people have access to healthy local food. So that is the end of my presentation. I hope that uh, everybody um, enjoyed it and I hope that you were able to learn something new uh, and increase your knowledge on some of the food initiatives in our Gwich'in communities and uh, what direction we should go in moving forward to strengthen food security in our territory. So thank you so much for, for attending this presentation. Hi, Cho. Hi, Cho, Rena. That was uh, fantastic. And it is wonderful to see the diversity and breadth of your research. I would um, invite if anyone, if, every, if anyone wants to turn your cameras on, we can um, see who else is on the call. And if anyone has questions, you are or a comment to make, um, you can flag your hand or you can put a note in the chat. There are um, a number of comments we've received, including that uh, the Carmichael's sold out within 20 minutes this year of putting their fish on sale. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa says she likes the hydroponic system. And there are uh, a number of, of 
thank yous for the presentation. Does anyone have a question or a comment they would like to make for Rena or for Dave about any of the what they've shared? All right, Rena, then I get to ask one, even though I get to ask you questions all the time. Um, but my question for you is, and what was most surprising? Oh, and then, you know what, I'll skip, I can ask questions anytime. I'll skip to Eric's, I see Eric's question here. So Eric is asking, uh, David mentioned there was a large volume of food harvested in the North being exported. Where could I follow up on that? Um, David, can I pass that to you on where he can find that information? Yeah, uh, Eric, and I could share the some of the reports with, with you, um, Devlin, if you don't already have them. But Eric, please feel free to follow up with me and I'll, I'll be happy to provide all that. Great, I will connect you guys over email. Uh, Sabrina, I'm gonna go back to my question, is what was most surprising about your research? I mean, you you had four months where you were learning and talking to all sorts of different people and you had worked as the community garden coordinator, so you knew a little bit about food and food security in the North before, um, but what surprised you through this? I would say um, just the, the commonality among all the Gwich'in territories, like all, or sorry, all the Gwich'in communities. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of things that we're experiencing that it's very similar. And that's where I started thinking, I'm like, why, why aren't we talking more? Like why, you know, we should have more connections and, you know, support each other. And, and you know, if, if we know something works in one area, let's share it with another area, you know, and uplift each other in that way. I, I found that very, uh, very, you know, surprising that, or, you know, that we need, we need more communication essentially is, is, uh, is what I, I noticed. Um, but I also like, I've, I've noticed so much um, um, passion and like pride, you know, I've, I've, I've spoke with uh, local hunters who are like, you know, I don't need to, I need, I don't need to go to the store. I get all my land or, you know, I, I get my food from the land and just the, the pride in their voice. It just sounds, um, you know, so amazing and, uh, and so inspiring. And uh, yeah, so I would say that was probably one of the biggest takeaways too. Thank you. Okay, last chance for anyone else to ask a question for, for Rena or for Dave. All right, a question came in from uh, Julian. Which do you think are the biggest challenges to engage youth in land-based programs? And maybe I'll ask Rita and then I might even put Frank on the spot because I know Frank's done a lot of work around programming on that one. Um, I think engaging youth is uh, something that's kind of common like throughout, you know, like everybody's inside on your phones or on the computers but i think that maybe if we just like uh think of like innov innovative ways that we could include technology you know like maybe like you know, how to how to skin a, a rabbit or how do you process a caribou like if we can like find a way where we can um cross both you know like on the land and then also uh things that we can do at home like make it more accessible uh the knowledge and um you, you, you can never uh, take away, uh, like you're, you're not gonna learn how to survive out on the land by, you know, your phone. So you definitely need uh, both um, both sources of knowledge. But uh, yeah, yeah, I would say that, um, you know, there, there, there are many people in the communities who are, uh, who are uh, taking kids out on the land. Like when, when somebody uh, knows what they're doing, like they usually uh, take kids with them and uh, that that's how they learn. So I would like to see, you know, some kind of program too, where maybe it's like a weekly thing where we hire one person to take kids out and, you know, get them familiar, get them comfortable with being on the land and learning new skills. Thanks. And Frank, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you want, if you have any comments on this, um, we're happy to hear them because I know you talked a little bit earlier about the berry picking. Yes. Um, I'm not sure what you want me to say. We did 
do some berry picking with the youth and um, we got cranberries and it was it was all right it was nice being on the land to harvest some berries and yeah the kids enjoyed it I think we wanted to get them like uh you know like how to hunt properly so we're thinking of maybe what was it um like how to properly hunt on the land and be respectful to the animals i think we're going to do something like that with the youth here hopefully soon hi, hi cho frank all right well, thank you for your questions. Oh, I see Nelly has one request. We'll do, we'll take this last one and then we'll close it. Uh, Nelly asks, is the funding one of the barriers to using and building more infrastructure? I see. Um, I think that uh, there, there are some, like uh, I mentioned um, uh, in Fort McPherson, uh, there are uh, they're building a community freezer, so they um, they were able to access funding for for that initiative. Um, but other than that, I I never seen a lot of um, funding going into initiatives like that. So I'm not sure if the funding is just not there, or if um you know maybe people are not applying for it. I'm not too sure, but um, um I noticed that uh, in the in Canada, like we are very supportive, like the the Quichin communities here and. Um, uh, so I, I think that it's just a matter of, um, um, yeah, applying for the, the funding and, uh, yeah, just um, co contact and keep bugging the government to, to support initiatives like this. Um, but, yeah, I, I think that uh, the funding is there or it should be there. And, uh, yeah, it's just a matter of doing some digging. I think they have a fish house in McPherson, right, that they just started this year? Yeah, there's a fish house that in the community that that's a great initiative too. That like it's right there in the community, so anybody who wants to learn how to work with fish can can go to the fish camp. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really nice too. Mm -hmm. oh, well, thank thank you everyone for spending your uh, whether it's morning, lunchtime, or afternoon, or some other time depending on where you're joining from. We really really uh, appreciate it and appreciate your interest in this. Um, a big hi to Rena for uh, months of work and to David for this. The, in the agenda that everyone got, there are some links to the Arctic Food Innovation Cluster Program if you want to learn more about the, um, this particular piece of work or um, there's links in there as well to the past work. Eric, I will follow up um, specifically with you on that. And if you know anyone else who is interested in seeing this, then um, we're running another session in like seven, six or seven hours uh, this evening. So thank you very much. And uh, we hope that you have a great day. I will ask Rena and David to just stay on with me for another um, few minutes. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.